guess I should start by saying the state of the Department of Physics and Astronomy is good. I think, isn't that what the president starts off saying when he gets here? Um, so now let's see if I can make this work. Ah. So uh, it's kind of traditional to start off with a couple of remembrances. We lost a couple of faculty members. Uh, well, one faculty member in this last year, Owen Johnson. I'm sorry about the quality of this photo because it's the best that we could find at this point. So if anybody has one, we'd love to have a better photo for the archive. He was with the department for uh, a very long time. He got his bachelor's and PhD both in physics here. And I think this picture dates back to about the time when he did. Um, but in any case, he passed away uh, this summer. Uh, then Lady Higgs, as we all know, uh, also passed away uh, earlier this year. Uh, he was undergraduate advisor. He taught evening astronomy. Uh, he did all kinds of things for the department, very devoted and very dedicated to the department. And then we've had uh, a number of faculty members uh, uh, go through an advancement in this last year. Uh, Professor Dimyad, Shanti Dimyad, uh, and also Professor uh, Savith Safarian were both uh, promoted to associate professor. Um, professor Kyle Dawson and Professor Zheng Jung were both uh, also appointed uh, pro uh, associate professor and uh, also achieved tenure in the department. Um, and then uh, Professor Efros uh, officially retired this summer uh, and he became Professor Emeritus. This picture may have also been taken about the time that he graduated. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so anyhow, um, Department Honors, uh, Valley Vardini was a global professor uh, with the University of Bath, UK, and actually spent some time there. Uh, so that's quite an honor. Richard Ingebretson uh, received the LDS uh, Student Association Teaching Award this last year, and Shanti Dimyad uh, received an NSF Career Award. And there have been a couple of changes in the staff. Um, senior accountant Kathy Blair retired uh, June 30th, and senior accountant Marcia Cook started July 1st uh, without uh, any break between the two of them. Uh, the transition is still going on. I think Marcia is uh, trying to keep her head above the water. I think she's managing all right, but it's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of work uh, just, just picking up from where someone left off. Uh, she's hired a work-study undergraduate, uh, Rasha Karim. Is she here? She's dead. Oh, she's busy. Okay, um, helping Marcia. And uh, we have a and our new advisor, undergraduate advisor Tamara Young, took over all undergraduate advising after Lynn's passing, and she's doing a superb job with that. Uh, so far, it seems that all the undergraduates know her. So that's right. That's the way it should be. Staff honors. Heidi Frank, 15 years now in the department uh, and doing superbly. Uh, Jay Norwood, 25 years. And Jackie Hadley, also 25 years. So let's congratulate those two. <laughs> and we have a host of new postdocs uh, who were hired over the last year who started. Um, I've listed all the names. I won't read them all for you, but would the new postdocs on this list please stand up so we can see who you are? No, they didn't get the word that we're meeting today? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see. They're all back in the lab working. That's where they are. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, new postdoc. Okay. Graduate students, let's see how well we do here. So we have 17 new graduate students, 14 of them men, three women. Would they please stand, any of them who are here? All right, welcome. Uh, so a few statistics. So there are 10 of, the, 10 of our new graduate students are domestic students and seven of them are international. So uh, these, uh, these seven come from China, India, 
Iran, and Malaysia. Uh, altogether now we have students from 15 countries, which is quite international, so we're doing very well there. Our total graduate enrollment is, uh, is hovering close to 100 students as it has, 98 PhD students, three master's students. Um, in this last year, we awarded 44 bachelor's degrees, which is a pretty healthy number. Now that's about a 50% increase from the year before, eight masters and 16 PhD. And I think that Tamara should be credited with a lot of this because she's been helping steer students towards graduation. So we're very pleased with those numbers. Um, undergraduate students, we have the total number of majors enrolled, and it depends on how you count them. Um, 285, 222 men, 63 women. So that's a big job for an advisor. Our enrollment, uh, it dropped a little bit last year, about 10%. Uh, this does hurt us in the budget because we were getting money from the uh, university in proportion to the enrollment that we, we have. Uh, so we took a little bit of a hit. Uh, we wondered whether this was because of the change in the missionary age of the LDS church. So a lot more uh, men and women went on their mission sooner, and so there were fewer students. And a number of universities around the state also felt the same thing. Our figures are not in yet for fall 2015. This is just the first week of classes. Uh, there are some indications that there's a slight drop in the lower division uh, enrollment and a slight increase in the upper division, but we're still looking. I think there's been a slight increase in a couple of our classes, like the ones that our majors take. And the department budget uh, has been uh, a little bit uh, in the red for the past couple of years. It's improving, but it's still very tight. Um, one new bit of news, we're remodeling one of our computer labs, the 205 South Physics, uh, has a new floor, uh, new desks, a projector and screen, and uh, we'll still have room for only 36 seats. Uh, Professor Leboic uh, is teaching Physics 3730 this fall, and normally we try to restrict the enrollment to 36, but the enrollment has shot up to 60 this year. So uh, if you see Professor Leboic in the hall uh, looking a little dejected, pat him on the back because he's doing a really great job in that class <laughs> under trying circumstances. So events in 2014-15, um, well, one interesting event last fall uh, was the opening of the movie Interstellar. This is a Christopher Nolan movie. It's about travel through a wormhole. Um, and Richard Ingebretson was very excited about this uh, and so managed to arrange for a special physics and astronomy advanced screening at the Gateway Multiplex. It was sold out and uh, the department earned a little bit of money from that and it was also very good department publicity because of the demographics, the young people, uh, a lot of them interested in science who went to see that screening. So we have to thank Richard Ingebretson who also helped sponsor that. Um, our faculty has been very busy organizing conferences and in August, 2014, Valley had a conference on the, uh, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the, of the uh, article announcing an organic spin valve and uh, brought a number of the his, uh, players in that, that venture uh, to campus and that was, that was a fun event, a small one, but fun. Um, Jordan Gurton uh, helped organize a conference in Snowbird on near-field optics, nanophotonics, and related techniques. That was also in August last year. Um, then the Telescope Array Group organized a conference in Springdale, Utah, uh, Ultra, did I get the acronym? Is it Ultra High, it's probably UHECR is better, Ultra High Energy Cosmic Rays uh, last October, it should have been October 2014. Um, the, yeah, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, 
And then Professor Kida and Springer organized a collaboration meeting for the Hawk collaboration, the high-altitude high water Cherenkov uh, counter uh, experiment, which is uh, sited near Puebla, Mexico. And that meeting was in February 2015. This is a picture of part of the Hawk array. Um, Dave Keita organized the Snow Cluster Conference uh, that took place in March 2015. And Jordan Gurton helped organize a TA training conference in Atlanta, Georgia called Mobilizing the Forgotten Army. And we actually sent um, a couple of people there. Uh, Brian Somm and Greg Furlick went to this. Uh, and then Christoph Burma organized an EPR symposium in July, in last some this past July. So a lot of activity. And we have one conference that I'm aware of, I hope I haven't missed any, uh, coming up in March 20, should be 2016 uh, and 2015. I have a little trouble with years. Okay. The department has a very active outreach uh, array of outreach events. As you know, we do star parties every Wednesday night, and uh, that, that brings in a lot of people to campus uh, to be exposed to the uh, kind of a little uh, one aspect of the research that we do, but also helps a lot in, in uh, department publicity. So it's a wonderful activity that we're doing. Uh, this July, we had a Pluto Palooza that was uh, in, uh, this was in celebration of the flyby by the New Horizons probe in, uh, by Pluto, and a very, very interesting event, some exciting science that came out of that. We also help with uh, some of the science fairs, like the Science Olympiad and the Intermountain Junior Science and Humanities Symposium. Uh, we help with the refuges program for refugee communities here in the valley, the access program for women, uh, high school and women coming to the university. And uh, then with our numerous physics shows that Adam hosts uh, and, um, and runs and astronomy talks that various people like Anil give and many more. So there are lots of outreach activities that we're involved in to be proud of. This past summer, uh, again, we had an REU program. Uh, this is a picture of not only the REU students but a few others who went to the, uh, the closing symposium. Uh, this is organized by, uh, by Professor Safarian and also uh, Tino Niawelo. Um, there are a number of people who helped with this, a number of our faculty who, brought, who uh, uh, helped guide students on their summer research activities um, and also a couple of people who helped with extracurricular activities I've listed here and run the machine shop. Uh, and we thank everyone who is involved in this because it's a very important activity. It's, it's also extremely useful for recruiting good graduate students. And, and I think a couple of the new graduate students that arrived this year uh, came to know the university through the REU summer experience. Um, Tamara, I misspelled your name, so GRE prep. And uh, graduate student uh, organizations, GSAC and WAPA also helped out with this this activity. Uh, the proposal, uh, a renewal proposal is being submitted right now. I think uh, Saviz is taking care of this uh, to the NSF. I hope that this, this activity will continue in years to come. Uh, and as I said, at the, at the end of the REU, summer REU, uh, there was a symposium organized. And this was not just for the summer REU students, but for all undergraduates and graduate students who wanted to participate uh, in the department. And indeed, we had 22 student presenters at this, this symposium that took place July 28th, so it was very recently. Um, and the, it was, you know, so you can imagine this was all in one day. They, they, each of the presenters had only 15 minutes each. Um, here's one example of one of Shanti's uh, students, Jasmine Hinton, who's an undergraduate, talking about lithium-6 superconductivity. So um, priorities for 2014-15, the coming academic year. <laughs> Did I say once again 2015-2016? <laughs> uh, yes, who can count after the years have gone by? So, uh, 
So um, I think one of the first important things that we will be spending time on this year is the biophysics cluster. Um, so let me explain. The senior vice president for academic affairs, Ruth Watkins, uh, last year uh, started a strategic, uh, well, uh, a program which involves multi-departmental faculty cluster hires. And she, uh, the, the way the system worked was that she asked various units around campus to make a proposal for a cluster hire of some kind. Um, and a number were awarded last year. People thought it was so successful that it is, uh, it was continued into this year. And uh, uh, Savi Safarian put in a biophysics proposal, which has been approved. Um, so what this means is it will add uh, four new faculty members doing biophysics to the university. No specific department has been designated. It's going to be a little bit like USTAR in the sense that the, uh, we will bring the candidates in and they will then say which department they think would, uh, would be most suitable for a home. Um, the College of Science in the upper campus uh, and biochemistry particularly in the upper campus are involved in this search. So it's quite likely that we will be able to add a new faculty member in our department in biophysics through this program. The searches are going to take place over the next two years. So that's one activity we will be involved in. Um, then other priorities uh, in curriculum and teaching, we, we added, we've been working on, on diversifying a little bit our undergraduate major tracks. And the first thing that we did last year, which was fairly, uh, fairly simple to do, was to add an astronomy an astrophysics emphasis to a bachelor's degree in physics. Um, we're going to continue doing this for other types of emphases just to give our undergraduates a wider choice of directions and also give them a little more definition in the kinds of choices that they make in their undergraduate major. The other thing we're working on is to improve the success rate in our lower division classes. We got uh, a chunk of money from the upper administration to do this. And so we're starting uh, working on ways that we can improve the success rate. The su success rate means the percentage of students who graduate with a grade of A, B, or C out of, uh, as, as a percentage of the number who actually started in the class. And we'd like to bring those numbers up. Um, we're also working, continuing to work on development. That means fundraising. Um, Last year, we got a couple of new gifts, uh, the, uh, one that supports outreach and one that supports summer astronomy RAs. And so this was, this was very useful. Uh, we're hoping to uh, be even more successful in the coming year. And uh, now that we have a new development director in the College of Science, Heidi Sheridan, uh, we, and we, we think we're going to be successful in doing this. Um, the Crocker Science Center is going to be another priority over the next couple of years. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a going to be the result of a remodel of the former Utah Museum of Natural History on the President's Circle. Um, it will uh, be it will be uh, set aside for undergraduate science education and also the Center for Cellular and Genomic Research. Um, there's some design pictures here. I'm not sure that this is, corresponds exactly to what it's going to be, but it'll be uh, an approximation of what it's going to be. This is uh, a place where we will, we will have undergraduates uh, go through advising, also maybe attend some of their classes, and also uh, some kinds of laboratories in this space. So this is going to be very useful, but if it's still not going to solve our own building problems. And we've, uh, our dean has been making this point very strenuously with the upper administration and the, the regents and the legislature, and we can. And what's good about the Crocker Science Center is that this thing was a, uh, a major initiative that the university had been working on for a number of years. Uh, and so it had to be, uh, the, the funding for this had to be resolved first before we could even start talking about um, a new building for our own needs. So our new building project, which is uh, a long-term process, uh, 
finding, and finding more space, better space for our own department was started already a number of years ago uh, under Professor Kida as a chair. Uh, the department went through a preliminary design uh, just looking at various options, whether or not we could re just add more space by adding to the buildings we have or whether we would need a completely new building and a completely new building still remains an option. We've been using this study to help us uh, leverage interest in the upper campus and um, thanks to the efforts of the, the dean and also our own strenuous efforts, um, we've man managed finally to get the senior vice president to approve an architectural study that will look at the needs of the whole College of Science, but it also certainly will include looking at ours. So there is some movement, but we're still looking at a process that could take several years to come to fruition. So also getting a new building is, is going to require some substantial and concerted fundraising because uh, if you can get major donors to help, then uh, this certainly gets the attention of the legislature. Another, so another thing that we're working on in this last year is TA trainings. So we've always had uh, a, a small training process as a part of the graduate student orientation for new graduate students to come in. But and last year we enlarged this to a one week fall training on best practices uh, teaching and this seems to be working out very well. We're, they not only do the students go through one week of training, but then during the semester, during the year, we have one TA who's designated as mentor, uh, a TA who's been trained particularly in uh, pedagogical techniques. This TA goes around and visits the discussion section TAs, uh, providing pointers, uh, doing surveys, uh, collecting information to see how things are going. Uh, Lauren Simonson in this past year was the TA mentor and Greg Furlick is taking over that job in the next year. So far it looks, we think that this process is beneficial. It certainly is increasing our TA emphasis on pedagogy and on student learning. I think it helps to improve the culture and I'm hoping that it also does uh, benefit the students and, and we see improved uh, success in our undergraduate classes as a result of that. Um, we also have a graduate student professional development class um, that we started last year. We're continuing this year with a little uh, change, a little bit in direction to make it a little more relevant to all of our graduate students. So new graduate students who are here, please be aware that this is part of the colloquium requirement that you come to this on Tuesday afternoon. There were a few who showed up and a number who didn't realize that they were supposed to be there. So Tuesday afternoons, 4 to 6 p.m., and what we do is we're doing uh, various topics. This was last year oriented particularly on having students uh, write proposals for an NSF graduate research fellowship. Uh, we're enlarging that so that we, we cover a variety of other things. So not only scientific communication, proposal writing, but also article writing, oral presentations, and so on. Career planning, writing resumes and research statements and also professional ethics. So this is uh, really career preparation and professional development. And this is something that I think all universities now in the country do uh, in their graduate programs. And it's good that we're doing it too. Um, as I said, required of all beginning graduate students. There you go. So uh, the next thing I'd like to do is to go through some research highlights. I asked our faculty colleagues to help me by providing me with slides, of an example of some research highlights, some small piece of the things that they do over the last year. And so I'm gonna go through this, um, the slides that I have, and I thank everybody who provided them. And I will ask the authors of these slides to help me a little bit if I stumble and give us a little more information. So we'll start off with condensed matter experiment and uh, Professor Fardini. Um, and so what Professor Fardini's group has been doing uh, some very exciting work on hybrid organic, inorganic perovskite-like devices. And this, the, the, the real economic interest in this is that it may lead to some uh, significant improvements in the efficiencies of solar cells. So this is a big thing and it's a very hot topic all over around the world and, and we're doing it here. Um, maybe you can explain what the figure is. 
my parents called it the booming period because uh, uh, the water was bad so much so that the parents called that it uh, actually contributed um, a, a great a great uh, political change in their life in Greece and so it's a boom in, uh, in uh, political feeling and organizing uh, the SDS meeting in this country and uh, probably we have session on Monday at night and uh, well I hope that uh, it will evolve the real uh, industry and uh, for the benefit of humanity. Yeah. So, and there's, there's a lot of basic physics involved in this too. Uh, Christoph Burma, condensed matter experiment, uh, working on, uh, also on organic uh, semiconductor-like devices. Is Christoph here? Yeah, I'm here. Ah, yes. Would you like to say a word about this slide? Yes, I can say a word about this slide. So, can you say <laughs> Okay, maybe three words. Essentially, what we've been doing is um, we, we look at electronic processes in what's called organic semiconductors. Organic semiconductors basically plastic-based electronics, and you can actually find these in a lot of technical applications nowadays, such as this one. So what's glowing here, which is called a, an OLED display, are actually organic light crystallized. And so you would think, whoa, these materials, technically, they can do a lot of stuff, and uh, so it's actually something for engineers. But the fact of the matter is that electronic processes in these materials are still not really understood. And what is known, but not exactly, is how the spin degree of the of electrons affects electronic pr uh, properties and therefore the, the magneto-optoelectronic material uh, properties of these materials. And this is what we investigated. And you can have quite remarkable effects, such as one reflected by this one data set that is used there. This is a data set that comes from a paper that was first authored by Kip Kansuji. Um, the second paper is there on the bottom. Um, what you see there, the colors represent essentially a term that's a member. And that is plotted as a function of magnetic field and a function of time. And the wiggle, <coughs> the oscillations that you see, they are caused by spin that is repressed uh, in the magnetic field. And that is quite remarkable that oscillating spin can control term. And this is what we are studying here at this mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Sam in atomic physics, experimental atomic physics, working on optically hyperpolarized noble gases. Is Brian here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to say a word? Signal source, so enhances the signal source so it takes as little as possible. Uh, if, it, if, if the polarization in those pieces weren't enhanced by four or five orders of magnitude, um, it's being used for things like targeted molecular imaging, which makes polarized neon in a cage, and you attach it to a, a ligand, which has a very specific uh, targeting moiety that, that, that links, and then you, you use various techniques to, to, um, to, to uh, light it up. Um, Polarized noble gases are also used in uh, miniature gyros. That's at upper left. And so these things are actually used. They get tiny little light sources and alkaline metals and Z mount 1.9 and 131. They're optically polarized, all in that little case. And these things are, are seeking uh, things like defense satellites, uh, orienting them the proper way. And then um, the field is also has a very productive branch that, that does very fundamental uh, measurement, uh, tests for fundamental symmetry. So I'll just say, in the next slide, one quick thing that we've been working on is um, in these pairs of noble gas, uh, alkaline metal noble gases, in this case it would be rubidium and, and uh, xenon-129, all rubidium and helium-3, we're able to use the, uh, the rubidium atom as kind of an embedded magnetometer. So we can use the hyperfine transition frequency of the rubidium to sense the magnetic field that's generated by the, the noble gas look at the, the graph at the right, what you see uh, is what's plotted is an heat 
PR frequency, much like the clock frequency in the atomic clock, that is the locked oscillator, so we're measuring that frequency as a function of time. And what you see is we've got two species in the cell that are that are hyperpolarized. One is helium three and one is xenon one point nine. And that first discontinuity happens when we, we destroy the helium two polarization with NMR pulses. And the second discontinuity happens when we destroy the xenon one point nine polarization with NMR pulses. The xenon has a very fast transchange rate and recovers in a matter of minutes, and that's the recovery frequency. The helium has a time constant for you know, its transchange on the order of hours, and so on this time scale, it basically wants to destroy itself. And so that's a, a magnetometer that's not you know, quite as sensitive as, as some of the, the really finely sensitive magnetometers that we hear about, but it's enough for us to, to do a lot of physics of, of the spin change process. Uh, it's good to about 50, well, in this bandwidth, I don't have a really proper location, but, but we're sensitive to about 50 hertz out of about 20 megahertz um, in this magnetometer to give you a rough estimate. Okay. Uh, Professor Wright, condensed matter theory. Did you want to say something about this? Yeah. Nice collaboration between theory and experiment. Yeah, always. Uh, so in astronomy, Kyle. distant object ever made in cosmology. So that's about 12 billion uh, years in light travel time. Uh, this is a measurement of you know, the, the picture embedded at 30 million years. It's also a picture of what's going to be. And we're designing the entire program to make this measurement. Uh, the project that ran for six years and 12 billion years last year. And we hope to have this out by the end of this year. Great. So peeling back to the beginnings of time just about. Anil.
Yep. And then in the, uh, I've been also working on this um, curvature of the Andromeda galaxy, uh, sort of just the nearest single point galaxy in our system. And we've had a big uh, heavy incident of big hot and probably the most clear big time stuff with the Hubble and the Kalman star cluster being the hottest. Um, it seems like the single galaxy has this uh, single point galaxy, which is just uh, very sticky since late summer. Thank you. Uh, John John. Yeah, so one study has a lot to do with um, uh, uh, large scale structure in the universe. So on the left, you can see it's a big uh, large scale structure in the universe, mapped out by galaxies. And uh, I mean, the symmetry is quite perfect. At this point, it is high gravity with the galaxies. So you can basically characterize, characterize the, the distribution of galaxies Measuring the, the two point project function of galaxies. So these are shown as uh, color clusters on the right. Okay, so you can see, okay, the, the, the two point project function has some interesting feature, has an interesting shape. It's not a circular, so it is uh, caused by the motion of galaxies which reflects the background of the universe. And uh, we, uh, together with Tim Wolf, who is a postdoc uh, in my group, and uh, he is leading for classic position and has done high astronomy for observatory. And so we develop a, a method to accurately model uh, this kind of the so-called redshift space distortion feature in the two-point project function. And you can see our model here, a best-fit model is shown by the uh, black cluster on the right, uh, on the right side. And then from this model, then we can uh, infer the symmetric to the galaxies inside the Gamma halo, and also infer the cosmic structure flow group. Okay, this can help us to learn about the galaxy formation and the cosmology. Good, thank you. Uh, then Ben, you say something about this? Nothing like observation. <laughs> and this is a slide on New Horizons. And the Pluto Palooza. I guess this is the publicity for Pluto Palooza, too. Yeah, yeah. So this is the New Horizons space Yeah, this is a this is a great hook for getting young people interested in science. So cosmic rays, a large group here. Um, Pierre was the one that provided this, but um, 
maybe if you want to say a word about this, Pierre. <laughs> Do they know? <laughs> Great. So then the high energy astrophysics with Dave Keita and Wayne Springer. Is Dave or Wayne here to talk about this? Ah. Yes, there's Wayne. Great. It's going to be a colloquium about excellent stuff. So it's exciting to see this turning on. Um, condensed matter theory. I guess I said condensed matter theory. It's kind of. I'm not sure that's the best classification, Yongshi. <laughs> Yeah, so field theory, topological field theory particularly. Did you want to say a word about this?
Impressive. Okay, thank you. So those are all the research highlights that I was, I'm, I'm able to present to you. Uh, and if I've missed anybody who sent me a slide, I apologize for missing them out. Um, so that's all I'm going to say today, except I want to remind everybody that we have a party tomorrow night. Uh, the Here We Go Again party. It's uh, at Liberty Park where we had it before. And it goes from 5 o'clock to 7. Uh, dinner catered by Cafe Rio, and uh, we're asking people to bring some contribution for a dessert. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> if anybody has any questions or comments, I'll try to take care of them or field them or have the faculty members field them. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, this is Eddie Thanell, who is uh, a co-chair of GSAC. Okay, thank you, folks. See you tomorrow. <laughs>